with our lecture in chapter three. We're going to talk about connective tissues in this segment. Make sure you have your outline with you. So this is a, a slide just to show you how our connective tissues are organized. Connective tissues are very diverse. Um, bone is considered a connective tissue and so is blood, just to give you an idea of the diversity that there is. Um, if you look at your outline, um, we begin with the characteristics of connective tissue, but actually, sorry, let's take a look at this. Connective tissue can be loose and dense. Um, loose refers to the fact that they are very delicate. So if you had some loose con connective tissue in your hand, you could pull it apart and damage it rather easily. Dense connective tissue is more like um, duct tape. So it's very tough and very hard to um, manipulate or damage or stretch or break in any way. Um, fluid connective tissue. So we're going to talk about blood only. We're not going to talk about lymph. Um, and then other kind of supporting tissues. So cartilage and bone are both considered um, connective tissues. And then there's three kinds of cartilage. We're going to go through each of those. So let's talk about in general, what is connective tissue? So in your outline, connective tissue is the opposite of um, epithelial tissue. So if epithelial tissue was avascular, connective Connective tissue is vascular, so there is a blood um, supply to connective tissue. Uh, there's blood vessels, but there is an exception to the rule, and that's cartilage. So cartilage um, is not vascular. We'll talk about that again. <clears throat> um, connective tissue is not on any surfaces because that's the job of epithelial tissue. It's underneath other tissues. It provides support for cells, support for organs. It's kind of like the scaffolding for your organs. Um, number four, the cells are widely separated by an extracellular matrix. So instead of being completely one cell next to another, just like epithelial cells or epithelial tissue is, these cells are wi wider and spread apart. So let's take a look at our first tissue type here. Um, this is actually an image of areolar connective tissue. Let me just write that here areolar connected tissue. So I use CT for connected tissue and I'll write that a lot and you'll see that in the homework. But let's talk about the fibers number five. So there are three fiber types in connected tissue, collagen, elastin, and reticular fibers. Collagen, as you see here, is the biggest um, bundle of protein fibers that you have. So this is the strongest Collagen is the thickest and it's very flexible and it provides tissues that have collagen um, bulk and also um, some strength and resiliency in the tissue um, as well as that flexibility. Um, so that's collagen. Elastin, in this picture it's called elastic fibers, is very different than collagen. You can see how it's pointing to these very delicate black lines. And in the actual histology slide, it's a very delicate black line as well. So elastic fibers are thin, they are relatively unbranched, and they're elastic. So they're very, um, uh, I wanna use the word elastic again, like a rubber band, you know? So you pull a rubber band, it's very elastic, it's not gonna have a lot of resistance to it. Um, you're going to find a lot of elastic fiber. It makes something um, very vers like bendable, bendy. So think about the outside of your ear, your external ear. You can roll it up or fold it down. Um, that's what elastic fibers will help the tissue do. Um, and then reticular fibers <clears throat> is seen here. Reticular fibers form a fish netting. So they're short, they're branched, and they are um, made in tissues that are allow um, filtering to happen. So think of an actual fishnet, right? So if you're going fishing, if you're one of those fishermen, and this is their fishnet, right? So it's a lot of um, crisscrossing of fibers to allow spaces, and those spaces, here I'll put an X there, right? That's where fluid will flow through, but maybe trap a larger cell, or in this scenario, fish, right? So reticular fibers or reticular, sorry, reticular connected tissue will be found in organs that like to filter. So kidneys and the liver and lymph nodes are have a lot of um, filtering 
they'll have this fishnet or network of connective tissue. So I drew reticular here. If I were to draw collagen, collagen would look big and thick and broad. That would be my example of collagen. And if I drew elastin, it would just be one very thin line, elastic fiber or elastin. Okay, <clears throat> so your job is to recognize both reticular fibers and collagen. Um, no, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, not that. Elastic fibers, so you're gonna to wanna to recognize elastic fibers and collagen in a histology slide. So collagen shows up as these broad pink bands. Um, this particular kind of connective tissue has all three fibers. Collagen shows up as the pink bands. Elastin shows up as those, again, those little tiny thin black lines and you cannot see the reticular fibers in this image. So <clears throat> the only two you're responsible for is elastic, the thin black lines, and collagen. Let's talk about the cells. <clears throat> so the cells of connective tissue are also um, varied, um, but they do contain these types of cells. Um, and I should say that every kind of connective tissue doesn't have to have all three of these fibers that maybe um, a certain kind of connective tissue like this one we're looking at, areolar, has all three. But um, your cartilage that you find in your nose only has collagen. So these are the possible fibers that you can find in connective tissue, but each connective tissue may not have all three. There's going to be different ratios in each one. The same with the cells. So many, many connective tissues will have the cells, but some will have more specialized cells. Let's look at the word mesenchymal. Mesenchymal cells, we can see that right here in this. Mesenchymal cells are stem cells. <clears throat> stem cells are cells that are inside of a tissue and they're just laying there waiting for any damage or any re replacement that's needed. When your tissue is damaged or it needs to be replaced or grow, the stem cells come into play, they reproduce, and then they will differentiate into a kind of specific cell. So stem cells are undifferentiated. If you've not heard that word, um, you should be familiar with it. So a stem cell is undifferentiated. Differentiated. Um, it just means it's kind of a generic, it has no particular job, but when it is induced to reproduce, one of the cells that it splits into will start to specialize into a specific job. And so that would be differentiation. So stem cells just lie there and it tells you, if you find stem cells in a tissue, that tells you that that tissue can regenerate. Let's look at fibroblast. A fibroblast is a kind of um, connective tissue cell that can make more fibers. I'm looking for the word fibroblast. I don't see it. I see fibrocyte. So let's not worry about fibroblasts. Um, fibrocyte, so uh, let me just mention that you're not responsible for ch like identifying the kinds of cells that you see here. Um, let me show you another picture. So this is an areolar. So you see how the cells, they just show up as little dots. I'm not gonna have you um, try and figure out what, which dot that is. Like is it a mesenchymal cell? Is it a fibrocyte? Don't worry about that at all. I just want you to know the definition of these cells, the function of these cells, and that you find them in connective tissue. So let's go back here. So um, fibroblast will actually make the connective tissue fibers. So if a cell, if sorry, if a tissue wants more collagen, the fibroblast will produce the collagen. If a particular tissue needs more elastic fibers because it was damaged, you need to replace them, the fibroblast will make the reticular fibers or the elastic fibers. Okay, so blasts create the fibers, but fibrocytes do not. Fibrocytes just maintain the fibers. They're necessary to keep them healthy, but they're not gonna create them. 
The last one is macrophage, and macrophage is a immune cell. We can see that word here. Immune cells are found throughout the body, and a macrophage means big eater. Macro is big, right? Macro is big. Phage is to eat. And so this kind of immune cell, part of your immune system, likes to go around and just gobble up anything that's dead or discarded or needs to be taken away. So um, it's, a, it's a nice cell to have your tissue here got infected with some bacteria, the macrophage could get rid of it. All right, so let's take a look at our areolar connective tissue. So we're gonna move through the kinds of connective tissue Notice that letter B is loose. So one, two, three, areolar, adipose, and reticular are all considered loose connective tissues. This is areolar connective tissue. For every single one of these connective tissues, you're gonna to need to recognize them by their image. You're also gonna to need to recognize certain aspects of them, and I will tell you what you need to recognize. So for this one, I want you to recognize both collagen and elastic fibers, right? So collagen should be pretty easy to recognize. It's these broad pink bands, right? This is a, a collagen fiber. This is collagen. This is collagen. Here's collagen. And then where's my elastic fiber? Elastic fibers are my dark lines, right? So really easy. Those two fibers I want you to recognize in areolar connected tissue. Now, where is areolar? What is areolar? So areolar is, <clears throat> as you can see, it's kind of airy and light which makes it loose, like you could tear this apart like cotton candy. It's very delicate, but you find it as a filler between two tissue types. So you'll find it, um, for example, underneath our epithelium. If you go back to my first lecture, you have epithelium, then you have the basement membrane, and then that's connected to connective tissue. Areolar is gonna be that connective tissue right underneath the basement membrane. So before muscle, before something else, it'll just always be areolar. So any sort of space filling area of the body, you'll find areolar connective tissue. The second connective tissue here is adipose. Adipose is also a loose tissue um, because it's, uh, you know, you can damage it, tear it apart. Um, and so the adipose you see here, there's very little ECM. So the word ECM or the abbreviation ECM in your notes that's extracellular matrix. Okay, I think I had that written down somewhere, but if you're confused, extracellular matrix. So notice that the adipocytes are truly side by side. There's a little bit of space between them, but not a whole lot of extracellular matrix. The cells of adipose is adipocytes. You want to know that. Um, they're pretty um, large, bubbly looking cells. Um, I think adipose is a uh, easier sort of tissue to recognize. Take a look at adipose. And you guys know adipose as fat. So these cells have a signet ring shape. Um, that means that the cell is nice and round for most of the cell, and then there is a flat area where you find the nucleus. Okay, so it looks like one of your class rings or something from high school. Um, this is going to be filled with fat. So your lipid, your triglycerides are going to be there. Um, so let's take a look at the um, jobs of fat, right? The functions of adipose, energy storage. I think we can all come up with that. Cushion and padding your internal organs as well as insulation, right? Providing warmth or thermoregulation, helping you stay warm. Those are all jobs. Um, where do you find adipose in the body? We can see here different locations. Obviously you know that there's fat um, underneath our skin. So that this little area underneath our skin is called the hypodermis um, or it's called the subcutaneous layer, but we call this fat subcutaneous fat. So deep to the skin is definitely an area that you wanna know about. Um, of course, our buttocks and breasts padding around the eyes and padding around the kidneys are all places where you find a lot of adipose. Okay, so here are some functions. I actually didn't put that it insulates shock, cushions, shocks, but um, you can add that to your list of functions. All right, 
Um, let's look at the two kinds of adipose, brown fat and white fat. So I actually do not have a picture of brown fat and white fat, but I can draw a little bit of a difference. So white fat is what you're looking at. White fat is fat. The, st the storage of the fat is in one nice big vacuole. So if I were to draw a nice big central vacuole here and then just put fat, right, that is how white fat stores its fat. If I were to draw brown fat, so let's draw a cell here. Let's say this is brown fat. Brown fat stores its, vac its fat into smaller unit vacuoles like this. It turns out it's easier to access that fat in brown fat. Brown fat is very active metabolically. So if you're gonna have a lot of activity, the tissue will have a lot of blood going to it, right? Because we need oxygen. That's what blood helps us carry. So brown fat has more vascularization than white fat. White fat is not as active. Why is brown fat so active? It has um, a lot of mitochondria to produce a lot of energy to make the person's metabolism kick up and to burn um, and keep them warm. So if you look at where brown fat is in, brown fat is abundant in infants and children. So kids, if you have a child or if you've been around small toddlers and babies, um, they don't really get cold very much because they have a lot of fat and the fat they have is brown fat. And the brown fat will burn the, the, adip the lipids in their cells and it's kind of like idling at a high idle for your car. You're kind of revving the engine, but you're not going anywhere. It makes your whole body warm up when you have a lot of brown fat metabolizing at a higher rate than white fat. So children and toddlers stay warm. It's kind of a protective fat for them not to get too chilled. Um, and so that's present in children. And that's why it's brown. You can see why it's brown. The many mitochondria, as well as the blood supply, give it that brown color. Um, white fat, by the way, is not um, dark. It's the kind of fat that you encounter if you eat chicken or an, an animal. Um, the fat that is considered white fat is either white or yellow in appearance. Um, and so we kind of have an idea of what that looks like because we've probably all eaten some kind of animal with fat in our life. Okay. So let's move on to our third loose connective tissue, which is called reticular. Reticular connective tissue, so let's take a look at this reticular fibers. Notice how the fibers are all sort of wiggly, short, a little bit branched, right? They look like that. Um, that are, is our reticular fiber. Remember the reticular fibers create a fish netting, right? So we're helping to create a fish netting appearance and then the, the round guys, those are the cells, the cells that are kind of held in that fish netting of this organ. So remember, fish net is for filtering. So here's our, or, our liver. This is a great filtering organ. Let's take a look at more locations where you have a reticular connected tissue base. The liver filtering, kidney filters, spleen filters, lymph nodes filter. Bone marrow doesn't filter, but it has it, okay? So the, but the majority of places you find this uh, is filtering organs, and you can see the reticular fibers show up as dark black lines, right? All this is the reticular fibers. So you're going to look for dark black, uh, and that's your sort of cue that these might be reticular fibers. All right. Let's move on to um, our next slide here. And this is just a review of our three loose connective tissues. So one of this is areolar, adipose, and reticular. Let's start with this one. What is that? That is adipose. Let's take a look at this one. What is that? That is reticular connective tissue. And then what is this? That is gonna be our areolar connective tissue. All right, so great. So on an exam, you want to be able to look at a picture like this, know what the tissue is. If I ask you something like, what is this cell called? Name this cell. So you would write 
adipocyte, right? And if I said, name this fiber, you would say or write collagen, okay? If I asked you, name an organ with this connective tissue, you would say any of the ones listed, liver, kidney, spleen, lymph node. All right, let's move on. So our dense letter C, there are two kinds of dense connective tissue, dense regular and dense irregular. Let's take a look at our dense regular. The reason why it's regular is because the collagen fibers are all parallel. So they're lined up in a very regular fashion. They're not completely straight. There's some wiggle to them. Um, and we can see some interspersed small nuclei. So this kind of dense regular connective tissue is what you want to think about when you think about your tendons and ligaments. So here's tendons and ligaments. Now, if we take a look at a tendon or if you think about your tendons and ligaments, note, you know how in, oh, actually let's define tendon and ligament. A tendon is going to connect muscle to your bone, okay? So tendons connect muscle to the bone. And what about ligaments? Ligament connects two bones, bone to bone. Okay, so there's your definition. In either scenario, these are like a little strap or a piece of tape that runs from one structure to the next, and they only run in one direction. And the reason the collagen fibers are running in one direction as well, right? So think about a blade of grass. If I pull up and down on a blade of grass, it's very, very strong. It doesn't want to break. But if I pull in a different direction, like outside, I can really tear that blade of grass very easily. So this kind of tissue, dense regular, only has strength in the direction that the collagen is running. So strength is only in one direction. So when you're walking in a normal fashion, your, the tendons and ligaments around your ankle are in their sort of comfort zone. They're moving in the way or they're they're resisting the stretch in the way that they're supposed to. But if you roll your ankle, right, if you twist your ankle, you've moved your ankle in a way that the tendons and ligaments are not used to, and you damage them immediately and easily because the, the collagen is not meant to resist from different directions. It only is meant to resist from one direction. All right, so, oop, sorry about that. So the functions of this is to provide attachments to muscles and bone. It helps to stabilize the position of bone and reduce the friction between muscles. All right, let's talk about dense irregular connective tissue. Now this is very different, right? Look at the picture of the actual histology slide. It looks like someone spilled paint, like there's a swirl of different fibers moving everywhere. It's still collagen fibers, but now instead of in a straight line, all regular, they are moving in all different kinds of directions. Okay, so many directions, and it gives this kind of appearance. Now, because the collagen is running in different directions, it provides strength and resistance in all different directions. So take a look at the function, provides strength to resist forces applied from many directions. It helps prevent overexpansion of organs such as the urinary bladder. So where do you find this kind of connective tissue? One of the places that I like to think about is the dermis of skin, and we're going to talk about skin in the next chapter. So it's good to just get that knowledge in your head already. That bottom layer of your skin, the dermis, is this kind of connective tissue. You think about how many directions your skin can be pushed and pulled in when you get a massage or if you have to move your body or um, itch, you know. So there's lots of different mo movements that your skin can make, but your skin is able to bounce back from any direction that's pushed or pulled. So that's where uh, I would like you guys to memorize um, this connective tissue is from. There are other places, capsules of visceral organs. I think those are a little bit more difficult to remember, but, but the dermis is probably the easiest place to remember. All right, so let's take a look at the two histology sides of our dense connective tissue side by side. 
which one is dense regular and which one is dense irregular. So let's look at this picture. Is that dense regular or irregular? And you probably answered dense regular, and that's correct. Okay, so we can see all the collagen fibers are running in this direction, and this is our dense irregular connective tissue. All right, moving on to cartilage. So letter D, cartilage. Um, cartilage is our exception to the rule, so it is not vascular. This is our avascular, avascular. And because cartilage does not have a blood supply running into it, it heals very slowly, if at all. So people who damage their cartilage, if you damage uh, your meniscus in the knee or some cartilage in your back, um, it's kind of just a long healing process because it, that direct blood supply is not there. Um, so it's made of collagen and chondroitin sulfate. So that's what the matrix, right? The matrix is made of collagen and a molecule called chondroitin sulfate. It's in your notes, um, but I'll put it down. Chondroitin sulfate. You can actually buy chondroitin sulfate at the Drugstore, I'm not sure if it works to boost your collagen, but you can buy it. Um, so the other thing about collagen is that there are, the cells are called chondrocytes, and the prefix chondro refers to cartilage. So chondro anything, it refers to cartilage. So that's why a cartilage cell is a chondrocyte, because a site is a cell. Cartilage, their cells are inside of a space called a lacuna. So you can see the lacuna is glowing white. It's that white halo around the chondrocyte. Okay, so all cartilages will have a chondrocyte in a lacuna. Now let's move through the three different kinds of cartilage. Hyaline cartilage which is what you're looking at, elastic cartilage, and then fibrocartilage. Hyaline cartilage, this is the most common, okay? This is the one where um, it's most prevalent in the body. So every single time you have a long bone, um, so long bones are just bones that are long, like the ones in your leg and your thigh, your arm, your forearm and your arm, you're gonna have some protective hyaline cartilage covering that bone to um, minimize friction. You're also gonna find, so between the tips of the, oh, you're gonna also find this between the ribs and the sternum. You're also gonna find this in the nasal septum, so in your nose. And then this uh, joints, right? Those, that's what I was talking about with the ends of long bones. Those are the joints. Um, the function of this kind of cartilage is to reduce friction, namely between the bony surfaces and provide a stiff framework. So I want you guys to just notice how this um, cartilage appears. The chondrocytes and lacuna are in little clusters, and then the matrix is pretty smooth. So there's nothing really going on in the background. It's nice, a smooth, light purple matrix. Here's another image of hyaline cartilage. So the chondrocytes are sort of randomly inter sort of placed within the tissue and then the matrix in the background is pretty smooth. I want you to compare that with the next kind of cartilage, which is elastic cartilage. So elastic cartilage, we still have our chondrocytes in a lacuna, but what we find in the matrix is not only collagen, but we're adding elastic fibers. So remember, elastic fibers were those dark black lines that we showed up earlier um, in the areolar tissue. That's what you see here. So you notice that there are these dark purple lines moving throughout the matrix and that's your elastic fibers. So what's going to do to the actual histology slide, it's going to turn the background black and purple. And sometimes it looks like there's just a bunch of squiggle marks or someone colored it in uh, black or purple. So that's what you're going to see. Um, where you find elastic cartilage, the easiest place to think about is your external ear. Okay. The auricle is the technical word for that part of your ear, but just say external ear. Um, and the other places are probably things that you are not super familiar with. Um, <clears throat> functions provide support, but it can um, distort without damage. So you can, 
distort your outer ear, right? You can fold it in half without damaging it. So our last uh, cartilage is a, a fibro cartilage. This is our strongest um, cartilage, meaning that it can resist a lot of compression. So you can push down on it really hard and it's gonna be just fine to resist that compression. So where do you find this? Perfect place to think about is the intervertebral discs of your back. When you stand up every day, gravity pushes down on your body. If you jump, uh, run, anything that is gonna impact you, know, you going down on the intervertebral discs, that's there to protect them. So another really good place to remember this is the um, meniscus of the knee in your knee joints. You know, when you jump and walk, you're also making a lot of pressure on your knee. Um, and then there's a place called the pubic symphysis <clears throat> between your two hip bones, um, right where your, your pubis, uh, I guess maybe your pubic hair and your genitals in that area, even the bottom of your um, hip bones, there's a little piece of cartilage there, and that's called your pubic symphysis. Um, and I have that in the notes. Pubic symphysis is a place where you find fibrocartilage. Okay, so how do you recognize fibrocartilage? The chondrocytes are going to line up in a stack. So you'll find stacks of them, um, right? They're not kind of uh, all scattered in a, in a random fashion. It is a tricky one to recognize, but that's what, how, what you want to look for. So name each cartilage type. So remember our three cartilages are hyaline, and elastic and fibrocartilage. So let's start with maybe this one up here. What does this look like? It's a tough one. This is fibrocartilage because I can see the cells. They are stacked into little, little rows, right? You can see these are all stacked in their own little lane. So that's what you want to look for for fibrocartilage. This one is hyaline cartilage. And again, we look, this one has the nice smooth matrix in the background. It has also the largest lacuna, I think. The chondrocyte itself is this little tiny dot. And then you can see the white space, that's the lacuna. And then this one then of course is the elastic cartilage, but only in this area. So this where I'm circling is where the elastic cartilage is. All this stuff is different material. So notice how black the background is inside the, where the elastic cartilage is. That's because of the elastic fibers. Okay, so elastic cartilage will be very dark. All right, so I have a note saying draw cartilage. So all I wanted you to draw was a lacuna and a chondrocyte, the cell inside the lacuna. So you can do something like that. This is a con, oops, chondrocyte. This is the lacuna. Oops, did I spell that wrong? Lacuna. <laughs> All right. Moving on. Uh, this is a cool little SEM of hyaline cartilage. So you can see the chondrocytes are in green and the lacuna, the space where they occupy, is open. And then you have the matrix of the hyaline cartilage in pink. All right, moving on to bone. So bone um, is obviously the most rigid connective tissue. The extracellular matrix, there's two parts to it. There's an organic collagen that provides your bones flexibility, and there's also inorganic calcium and phosphate that makes it very hard. The outer parts of bone is made of compact bone. So notice in this picture how we have this outer edge that looks different than the inside. So this outer edge is called compact bone. Every single bone in your body has this outer edge of compact bone. Every single bone, no matter if it's a finger, a, a rib, your skull, it will also have an inner spongy part. So this is called spongy bone. All right, so um, we're only gonna look at compact bone histology for this unit. So let's take a look at that. So we're looking at our compact bone okay and we're taking a look at how it's or organized it's organized in these little circular units we see a circle a circle <coughs> excuse me a circle those circles are called osteons 
okay? So it's called an osteon. So the word osteon is right here. Um, within an osteon, there's these different parts to it that we're gonna go through. So an osteon, every single osteon will have a central canal. That central canal contains blood vessels, right? So the blood, your bone is dynamic, it's growing, it's changing in small ways every day. So it's definitely a living tissue that uses a lot of blood and energy. So there's a blood supply that runs through your bone um, in these little central canals. Then the word lamellae, uh, you can see the word lamellae here. Um, this is just the stuff uh, of the bone, like it's the calcium, it's the phosphate, it's the collagen. It's kind of like the matrix of bone, okay? So when it says matrix, it's kind of like the lacuna. So let me explain. The lacuna is, is organized, sorry, not the lacuna, the lamellae, sorry, we're in bone. The lamellae is organized in these concentric circles. So here's an osteon, here's the central canal, and then notice how we have these little dark dots. These dark dots are making kind of a, a small circle and then maybe another ring out, or out from that. So if we connected the dots, it, lo it would look like we have uh, two rings, right? So each one of these, or actually three rings, and one, two, three, right? So those three imaginary rings. The bone material within this ring is called the lamella. So because it is found in this concentric circle, we call this a concentric lamella because it's organized in a circle. That's why the word concentric lamella is there. There's different kinds of lamellae. We'll figure that out in chapter five, but for now, just know that the word lamellae is the bone material that's laid down in these concentric circles within the osteon. Another subject, uh, another term you wanna know is canaliculi. Canaliculi are these tiny little cracks. It looks like hairline, um, cracks in the bone, but it's not, it's not a crack or a mistake. It's little tiny canals, small canals that is going to allow the blood and oxygen nutrients to reach the outer rings, right? So notice that the blood is only in the central canal. How are our cells, our osteocytes inside our lacuna? So those dark dots represent the osteocytes. How do they get blood? through those tiny little channels called canaliculi, okay? But they show up very, very, um, they look like scratch marks within the osteon. Okay, so let's take a look at and let's review these terms. So here we have uh, a labeled picture for you. So we have an osteon, right? So where is my osteon? It's roughly here, okay? Here's my central canal. It has another word called Habergen canal, but we're just calling it central canal. And then we have our black dots, right? We can see every black dot here. Our black dots represent an osteocyte. So every one of those is a bone cell, osteocyte. And our bone cells are also in a little space called a lacuna. But the lacuna is so small, you can't see it. Remember, cartilage is also a cell inside lacuna, but the lacuna are bigger and you can see them. So those are our osteos inside the lacuna and we can kind of make out the canaliculi, those tiny little scratch marks I can see here. I can see some more scratch marks over here. So um, that is our bone histology. So in this picture on the left, Let's just circle some osteons, right? So here's an osteon, one, two, three, four, something like five, six. So those are all our osteons, right? And then we, each one has a central canal. The dark little dots represent osteocytes in lacuna. The um, canaliculi don't show up very well here in this image, but um, let's move on to this. This is called the Volkmann's Canal. This is your last bolded word here. So Volkmann's Canal connects two central canals. So take a look at this big black smear. 
this is going to be a canal that connects the blood vessels from one osteon, right? Here's one osteon, and here is a second osteon and with its blood vessels. But if the blood vessel wanted to branch and then move over to the other osteon, this is where the blood vessels will branch and move. So this is called the Volkmann's canal. All right, and then you can see there's another one right here, right? Here's another osteon. Here's the central canal with blood vessels, and we can connect the two central canals. All right, this is a cool SEM of bone, so we can really see the vasculature inside the central canal. And now we can see the lacuna because they've actually removed, I think the osteocytes died, and they left a space. So we can see the tiny little hole, which is the lacuna. All right, so let's talk about spongy bone really quickly. Spongy bone is um, also known as cancellous bone. It's also known as trabecular bone. The um, spongy bone has a lot of spaces in it. So this is where we would have bone marrow and where we would have um, blood cell formation. So it's red bone marrow here and this is where your blood cells are made. And the bony parts, like what's the bone little, you know, the spicules or the, the fabric of this bone is called trabecula. Trabecula is single, trabeculae is plural. Okay, so that's the, what you want to associate with spongy bone. Moving on to blood. This is our last connective tissue. Um, lots of connective tissues, right? Blood is our only fluid connective tissue. Um, its function is to transport different items throughout our body. Um, they listed some things here like gases, nutrients, wastes, other, right? A lot of things travel through our blood. Um, everything travels through our blood basically. And then, um, so the location obviously is inside of our blood vessels. And for now, I just want you to recognize three formed elements of blood. So blood contains two parts to it. Blood is going to have what's called formed elements. And this is going to be your blood cells, red blood cell, white blood cell, and platelet. And that's what I want you guys to know. The other part of blood is the plasma, which is the water. And you can't see that, so I'm not going to ask you to identify it. So I want you to recognize the three formed elements. I want you to recognize red blood cells. These are, the technical word is erythrocyte. I want, so erythrocytes are just these bubbly, nothing going on, these red bubbles. Most of your blood cells will be erythrocytes. Notice there's no nucleus, no nucleus because they don't have one. Um, this is the only cell in the body that does not have a nucleus. They actually lose their nucleus and all their organelles before they leave your bone marrow so that they can carry more oxygen. Um, the white blood cells, otherwise known as leukocytes, are, I don't need you guys to memorize neutrophil or lymphocyte right now. All I want you guys to recognize is look at how different this cell looks Look at how different this cell looks. These are both white blood cells, okay, or leukocytes. <coughs> Excuse me. Lastly, I want you to recognize this little guy here. This is a platelet or a thrombocyte, okay? And these guys are to clot your blood. They're for blood clotting. So again, red blood cells or erythrocytes, these guys are for carrying gases white blood cells or leukocytes. These guys are for, um, they're basically your immune system, immune surveillance, and then the thrombocyte is um, otherwise known as a platelet and it's to clot your blood. All right, so this is just another image of blood cells, red blood cells. These are all the different kinds of white blood cells, but for, no, for now, just note, recognize the word leukocyte is for white blood cell and then platelets for clotting. All right, we're going to pause here.